Salamat sore. Good afternoon. I'm Gary Quinlan. I've been Ambassador of Australia to Indonesia for the past three years. And it's great to be here this evening, although not uh, in person, but virtually. We all do our engagements virtually these days and have for almost a year. And I think it's been a revelation to all of us, certainly to me, of how effective that kind of virtual interaction can be and, of course, how essential it is. Uh, I want to thank uh, Vice-Chancellor Margaret Gardner, of course, of Monash, uh, also Professor Sharon Davies, the new director of the Herb Feast Centre, especially, of course, and preeminently, uh, Indonesian Consul General Ibu Spisa and also Professor Andrew Byrne and Professor Sharon Pickering. And, of course, above all, thank you all for tuning in to us today. Monash, of course, as we all know, is one of Australia's great educational institution, among the greatest, and preeminently one invested very heavily in Indonesia and in the relationship between our two countries. There's not only this centre under whose auspices we're meeting today, but also the fact, as you know, that Monash is on the verge of opening um, its university campus in Indonesia, the first foreign university in Indonesia, and that despite COVID. So the momentum is there and it's been a tremendous effort and we congratulate uh, everybody at Monash and elsewhere and in the Indonesian government system associated with achieving that wonderful outcome. Now, the subject of Australia-Indonesia relations 2021 and beyond now, that's a, a pretty big subject, so I want to limit myself, obviously, in the time available to sort of um, some headline points, which uh, hopefully will help crystallise additional thinking by all of us who are so engaged in the relationship as we map out and chart an even better future between the two countries. First of all, I want to emphasise the fact that relations between our two countries are very resilient. Sometimes people have thought, oh, they're a little bit fragile, but they're not. History has shown how resilient they are. They should be resilient because we're neighbours and you certainly hope they would be. But time has told and it is a resilient relationship. And COVID-19 and our aligned responses to what has been globally the most disruptive event for all of us since World War II, our aligned response between these two neighbours, us, has shown exactly how resilient the relationship is. We've been at a turning point, an historic turning point, between our two countries over the past few years. And the reason is, I think, because the rest of the region, and in fact the world, has been at a turning point. And this predates COVID. COVID has made that turning point and what it means for all of us that much clearer, that much starker. But the trends that were changing our world and the calculus that each of our governments, each of our countries brings into play when it thinks, of, thinks about our places in the world, those trends were already there. The historic shift to the Asia-Pacific, what is now broadly known as the Indo-Pacific, the historic shift of political, economic, strategic gravity to our part of the world, the massive technological change we're all experiencing, fastest change in human history, and that, of course, makes everything uh, more volatile, more difficult to cope with, and, of course, profound ecological change. All of these things uh, have led each of our countries Indonesia and Australia to assess what is happening, what's going on, and what do those changes mean for each of us. And each of us actually make the same judgments. Our policy choices on how to deal with that uh, uh, dramatic change will inevitably vary a bit, but in fact we make the same kind of assessments. And as a result of that, despite occasional differences over policy, but not important, uh, we are fundamentally aligned with each other. And above all, we are very, very actively focused on how we can both become more resilient countries ourselves and with each other by shaping the region in which we live, by combining our respective convening power 
and operational power to leverage the kind of cooperation we need to shape our region. Now, President Widodo visited um, Canberra, Australia, on a state visit uh, a year ago, February last year. Um, I had the good fortune uh, to be present for that visit, and he addressed the Australian Parliament during the visit, only the second Indonesian uh, president to do so after SBY in 2010. And during that address to Parliament, President Widodo described Australia, and I quote, as Indonesia's closest friend. Now, leaders, of course, and diplomats always say that kind of thing. But the fact is, and particularly if you're addressing a parliament, but the fact is that it's true. Politically, the two countries have never been closer. During the visit, both leaders announced a plan of action to operationalise, to put into effect, implement uh, the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, which was signed off and adopted by both leaders during Prime Minister Morrison's first visit to Indonesia as Prime Minister, six days after he became Prime Minister in Australia in August uh, 2018. Now, there are five operational pillars and serious pillars in this detailed plan of action, five pillars under the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Four of them are sort of bilateral, you know, economic cooperation, uh, people-to-people cooperation, security and defence, maritime. And then there's a fifth pillar, uniquely, where both countries set out different areas where we can cooperate with each other to shape the region. The uh, Comprehensive Strategic Partnership and both our countries have very few of these agreements. They're the top level diplomatic agreement that you can have with another country Um, and we only have a handful uh, uh, of these agreements, each one of us, Indonesia and Australia. They are important because they make our cooperation accountable, systematic, routine. The Australian Cabinet will receive a report every six months on the implementation of that plan and that's unique because it is so important to us. So that's a game changer. The other big game changer for the next decade as we map out the future or try and map out the future is the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership, i.e. CHEPA. And that came into force last July during COVID. So that's there. Our response to COVID-19 has actually shown the response between us and certainly on Australia's part, how closely aligned we are, our two leaders, have been in regular contact by telephone, exchanging notes on what's happening with COVID-19 in each country, regionally and globally, and aligning policy to influence other countries in their response and to try and get some global leadership on COVID-19. There has been an absence of leadership on global on COVID-19. It's, it's just been obvious. So two middle countries like Australia, middle powers, have needed to cooperate more closely to bring the right kind of messaging to other countries about how serious the problems are and how quickly we needed to act. So leaders have been in contact, the foreign ministers constantly in regular contact, the defence ministers on the phone um, regularly, every month, and the heads of our defence forces likewise, our treasurer and ministers for finance and some other ministers um, in very specialised areas, IT, communications, those kind of issues, all been having a constant dialogue to exchange notes and align ourselves with each other. We've put a tremendous effort into ensuring that all the regular meetings we have at ministerial level every year and at officials level take place so that we didn't lose momentum and create a much bigger gap than uh, than we need and want despite the pressures of COVID and the difficulties on counterterrorism, on cyber security, on maritime and border issues, on law and security issues, on education, All of those engagements have been happening and I think that in fact the regularity of that engagement between Australia and Indonesia has been the most we have had, Australia, with any other single country and the most Indonesia has had despite the challenges of COVID. We inaugurated a new senior economic officials meeting last August 
that will be a very important part of our economic relationship on policy into the future. We will soon be issuing a what we call a blueprint um, for business on how to take the opportunities that IHEP offer and do something about them. This is what you can do. We, we try and give a bit of a, a guide as to how you can best utilise the opportunity of that agreement. We'll soon be having a uh, an inaugural senior economic ministers meeting. Our trade, investment and economic ministers will be having our two plus two, that's our defence and foreign ministers in both countries, meeting soon. Uh, maybe virtually, but maybe if we can manage it uh, in person. We're working on that. And also um, our annual defence ministers meeting and another very interesting meeting, um, the first trilateral foreign ministers meeting between Australia, Indonesia, India. This is a new trilateral relationship in the region focused on how we can help each other build resilience in the Indo-Pacific. And of course, later this year, we will have our annual leaders meeting. Also in our COVID response, our development program um, and partnership with Indonesia, we pivoted that to the COVID-19 response and Indonesia's own priorities for that response as soon as it was evident that COVID-19 was going to be so disastrous for everybody. We pivoted that program for a focus on technical and economic and governance advice, public health advice, social protection, these key areas as priorities in Indonesia's own response. We extended um, late last year a loan uh, for $1.5 billion for budget support, direct budget support, uh, to Indonesia's COVID response and we will continue to keep looking closely at whether some additional fiscal support in the future might be useful. Now of course we're also working on vaccines and we have a hundred million dollar program, a hundred and one point nine million dollar program announced recently focused on Indonesia as part of a broader half a billion dollar program on vaccines for the region and of course we'll continue to work on vaccines because they are the light at the end of the tunnel. They are so essential. Now, of course, um, we know that we can't just, in looking at the future, revert to the 2020 settings or the pre-COVID settings. COVID has changed everything. We know that. Indonesia's own economy, of course, uh, went backwards, contracted, um, in 2020 for the first time since the Asian financial crisis in 1998. Poverty rate, unemployment have increased. A large number of small businesses have had to close. Education, and I want to emphasise that, has been particularly affected with schools basically closed for almost a year with a, with a bad impact and big impact on the younger generation. And youth and education, always the key to the future, but the key to the future between our two countries, youth and education, these are the key and the areas we need to really focus our continued programs and cooperation on. The difficulties of the public health system have become very obvious um, and the need for really well-targeted, effective social protection systems and also money. Because business contracted, went backwards, the amount of money available through tax to the Indonesian government has fallen substantially. And so at the time when there is a bigger and bigger demand for expenditure on education, social protection, assistance uh, to industry to rebuild, at that very time, money available to do that has declined. So uh, the need for revenue boosting through tax reform has become so much more obvious. Now, we expect that President Widodo uh, will make every effort to continue to keep the economy open so it can grow. And um, we expect that will continue, uh, despite the fact that COVID-19 is um, going to become, uh, remain, obviously, a serious problem, uh, at least for another year. And of course, um, the government's vaccination program in a country which is so vast, the fourth largest country in the world, massive archipelago, that vaccination program um, will need to continue to have wide effectiveness at least until the second quarter of next year. The Indonesian government's own 
budget estimate is the economy of Indonesia will have contracted, gone backwards by about 7%, will be 7% smaller than it was pre-COVID. I mention all of this to indicate um, the ecosystem with which our two countries are dealing. Australia has... uh, and it has and is coming out of the uh, pandemic uh, better than a lot of other countries, but um, uh, not without challenges. But in terms of the cooperation needed between our two countries in this scene, clearly we in Australia need to be very alert, very sensitive, conscious of the really difficult ecosystem that our biggest neighbour and friend is facing. Now, I shouldn't talk for too much longer. Looking to the future... Um, I think, first of all, let me make one or two comments on the economic side. Uh, I've mentioned IA Chepa, and this will establish a new platform for economic integration over the next decade once we start to rebuild and get out of the immediate bad impacts of COVID-19. Areas where we're going to particularly focus, apart from trade, of course, and the trade between the two countries has not Um, been affected as badly as we feared. In fact, it's gone down a little bit, but in some areas it's gone up and has favoured Indonesia in some areas. So we want to see more of that, frankly. But we want to focus also very much on services and investment. Getting Australian investment into Indonesia and getting more Indonesian investment into Australia, a good thing. Areas in particular that IA Chepa, I think, opens up uh, for business is private health care, tourism infrastructure, anything to do with uh, digital startups and the digital economy, education, particularly vocational education and training, and renewable energy. Uh, And this is going to be a big focus of the future. We're also about to sign uh, fairly soon a new uh, memorandum of understanding of cooperation on agribusiness between the two countries and developing a new way in which we can get better integrated supply chains to work with Indonesian business for Indonesia's food security. And that's quite vital. I should mention our development cooperation partnership will obviously continue uh, and it will continue over the next couple of years to give a big focus to um, uh, the economic recovery from COVID, to public health needs, to technical and economic advice um, broadly, to social protection, and traditionally um, a focus also on disaster management. So they'll be um, the foci, if you like, of where we're going with IA Chepa and the development program in the future. Another area I'll mention, counter-terrorism, because it's always of interest to people. Indonesia has some of the best counter-terrorism um, uh, people, anywhere in the world, in any country which faces a level of terrorism of any of any threat. Uh, Australia and Indonesia remain the closest partners in our region on counter-terrorism. Our two police forces have the closest relationship of any two police forces anywhere in the world to resist counter-terrorism. Um, but it's there. It'll always be there, probably. Um, uh, but it's an area where we do a tremendous amount very positively with each other. I'll mention cyber and cyber security issues because the threat of cyber intrusions to our critical infrastructure, to our national security, and to our digital economy has become so much starker and so much more obvious uh, to each of our countries over the last few years, and the threat from disinformation, the misuse of cyber opportunity. We will be working much, much more closely on those threats jointly um, over the coming decade. Defence, we do actually have very good defence relations and always have an occasional hiccup in relations up and down. Uh, We haven't had that for a long time. We don't expect to. Um, Defence cooperation is actually quite strong, particularly with training, and that's going to increase. And new areas of procurement, of buying equipment, we're both developing our own defence industries. So there's more opportunity over the forthcoming decade and all of that, and more and more joint operations. One thing I want to mention, because it's historically symbolic but really potent, is that we are working on finalising arrangements for uh, an Australian and Indonesian co-deployment on UN peacekeeping. 
This was announced by our defence and foreign ministers uh, a year ago, and we're working on it now. Uh, that, um, if you think about it, is an, is, is an historic development, as I said. Our two countries contributing peacekeepers together under a joint mandate of the UN Security Council to look after peace and security in a part that hasn't been announced which country yet or which peacekeeping mission in our own region. Historic. Um, that kind of cooperation, I think, will just continue routinely into the future. And also we'll be doing a lot more work on uh, joint deployments on humanitarian and security relief. Maritime. Anything our two countries do on maritime is by definition vital and important to both of us. Uh, we're both maritime countries, Indonesia, the greatest archipelago in the world, huge number of islands, vast space of ocean, much of which you share with us. And we are, we're a continent, but a small country in population size, but a massive country in terms of uh, uh, geography. And then we have India as the other great maritime country in our immediate region. So you've got the three countries, which is why trilateral cooperation in maritime is going to be so much more important because we share the same maritime ecosystem and challenges and the same maritime strategic geography. We'll be doing a lot more cooperation in the Indian Ocean. We'll be focusing more on plastic waste, what we can do together. CSIRO in Australia is doing some work uh, with others, uh, Indonesian counterparts on what we can do there, and more and more effort to um, combat illegal fishing. Internationally, uh, we are both great proponents of an Indo-Pacific vision for our region and, of course, um, ASEAN. We, Australia, see ASEAN as absolutely vital and central to the regional strategic calculus, the calculus which needs to be secure, but also to deliver prosperity for each of us. And we'll continue to work closely on that. Uh, we are at the moment um, uh, very, very uh, pleased to see the leadership being shown by Foreign Minister Retno uh, within ASEAN and the region on Myanmar and what we do about that. We're your strongest supporters always in ASEAN Australia. We have been your first dialogue partner since 1974. And everybody in this country, from the Prime Minister down, when they speak of foreign policy, always say one of the two or three key operating principles is the importance of ASEAN. We're both members of the G20. We sometimes forget that. Indonesia, we're both G20 economies. Indonesia will be chairman of the G20 next year, and we're already tightly engaged in talking to each other how we can um, work together on the agenda and how do you get results out of a G20 dialogue and also is there a way with uh, expertise that we can exchange to develop the capacity uh, for the G20. We're both working very closely together on reform of the World Trade Organization where Indonesia's taken a leadership role and Australia as well and also WHO, the World Health Organization reform. We'll be working ever more closely on that. I'll conclude by mentioning people-to-people -people links. Now, these are, are always the hardest, uh, in a sense, to assess and characterise because they depend ultimately on not just what we know about each other but also what we feel about each other. So it's very difficult to sort of uh, assess how successful people-to-people -people relations are going. Obviously, youth are the key. And given the fact that Indonesia is one of the greatest young countries in the world, will always continue to be a key um, as we map out the next decade. Education, we were really making great progress. More and more co uh, connection. The new Colombo plan from Australia, the Indonesia, the preferred country of choice, uh, and in the first five years of the new Colombo plan, 10,000 Australian students spent time in Indonesia. We've lost some of that momentum because of COVID-19. We've engaged the program virtually, the mobility programs. We're going to have to work extra hard to rebuild that. And the university framework in Australia to help support our teachers, um, the New Colombo Plan. We do need to put a lot more effort into uh, study and research collaborations 
between our best institutes and our best universities and what Monash, of course, uh, is doing in Indonesia and plans to do in the future is a very exci exciting pointer to the future in that. Tourism will take a while to rebuild. Indonesia is the second most preferred country in the world, destination for Australians to be tourists in. The other one is New Zealand. And we need to rebuild that. Of course, we're hostage to when the borders can reopen. But once they can, safely, there are a lot of Australians already making plans to see how they can re-engage with their favourite place in the world, for obvious reasons, um, Bali. We need to get more Australians out of just Bali, by the way, and get them to visit other great parts of Indonesia, and it's something we need to do some more work on. Culturally, COVID-19 has had a big, big impact on the cultural communities in both countries. And we've lost, you know, some of the momentum in the exchanges in the cultural area. We've done our best to keep things going. Uh, I've opened, uh, well, four or five different art exhibitions over the last six, seven months and other cultural events in particular. So we didn't lose momentum. I've done all of that virtually with other people to try and maintain that effort. But we're going to have to double down and do more to rebuild some of that. And I'll conclude by mentioning interfaith connections. Um, both Prime Minister Morrison, President Widodo, and President Widodo and former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull made this a priority of our engagement with a, with a direct personal commitment that each of our leaders has brought to that. We began uh, an interfaith dialogue formally two years ago in Bandung, and we want to resume that as soon as we can, even if we have to do it virtually. I had a conversation the other day with Indonesia's new Minister for Religious Affairs, and we're going to work on this as a commitment over the next few months. This is an area where, obviously, we in Australia have a lot to learn from Indonesia's experience of Islam, and we want to understand Islam as a country with a relatively small Muslim population. We want to understand Islam through Indonesian eyes. You have a lot to teach us in Indonesia about this, and we have a healthy appetite to learn more in that area. Now, there's no doubt um, we need to redouble our efforts, particularly on the people-to-people -people, uh, front, and that's where you, who've tuned in this afternoon, are so important as well, because I hope you can continue to be not just interested observers in discussions about our two countries and where we're going and planning for a better future together, but that you can be really active ambassadors in widening the catchment of people who we need to get engaged in what we're doing between the two countries because Indonesia's success is Australia's success. I'm quoting our Prime Minister to that effect. Uh, it's absolutely true and we are linked historically uh, since independence, your strongest supporter in Indonesia for Indonesian in independence and, um, and we always will be. So uh, I look forward to continuing to work for a short time um, this year uh, before I conclude my posting later in the year, uh, my three-year assignment. But I look forward to trying to pull together some more threads and working with Monash in particular uh, and the centre, uh, which I'm really pleased to engage with this way again um, as we map out that future. So thank you, and um, uh, I hope you have some good discussions today with some of those questions. Terima kasih.